Howdy, it's Kyle talking about the U.S.-Mexico border. It's a really unique part of the country that not a lot of Americans have gotten a chance to see or experience. And of course, it's been in the news a lot lately, but if you're expecting to hear me talk about illegal immigration or kids being separated from their parents at detention centers, well, sorry, this is not the video for you. But because it has been in the news so much lately, I just wanted to go over the general geography of the region. So the cities and some of the natural landscapes and other things you can expect to see in the border area. My very first video posted to YouTube was about road tripping along the U.S.-Mexico border, but that was more about people that are actually doing that road trip and things to stop at and pretty cool things to see if you're visiting down there. This is more about just a general geography of the area to kind of give an overview of what the region is like because, again, not a lot of Americans have been down there to see it for themselves. Some general information about the border, it's about 2,000 miles long. So to put that in perspective, that's about the same distance from New York City to Yellowstone or about the same distance from Los Angeles to Nashville. So it's a much longer border than a lot of people might expect. And there are about 8 million people that live in a county that borders Mexico. And that's about the population of Virginia. So there are quite a few people that live along the border as well. There's a pretty interesting map that shows the percentage of the population in U.S. counties that is of Mexican origin, and that's compared to the old borders of Mexico before what became the southwest United States became part of the United States. And so obviously there's a very strong correlation between the two with, you know, these areas that were once part of Mexico is still where the vast majority of people of Mexican descent live. And so that's why you'll hear a lot of Hispanics in the southwest say, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. So that's just some basic information about the border area. Now I want to talk about specific spots along the border, and I'm going to start from east and head west. The easternmost point along the border is Boca Chica State Park in Texas, right along the Gulf of Mexico. And this is a really nice subtropical beach. It's got the same climate as South Florida. It's just south of South Padre Island, which is much more well known. So there isn't really a town at Boca Chica, but it is the easternmost point along the border. The easternmost city along the border is Brownsville, Texas, and this is a medium-sized city that sits right along the Rio Grande, and the main street of the town goes right up to the Border Patrol checkpoint, so that's just pretty interesting that, you know, you're at the Main Street Bank, and then right next to that is the checkpoint, so, and Brownsville is a very Mexican-type city as opposed to, like, an American city, and in general, the Texas part of the border is much more Mexican than, say, the California or Arizona part of the border, so, you know, Brownsville feels like a Mexican city even though you're in the United States. The greater Brownsville area is referred to as the Rio Grande Valley, and this is an area that has 1.2 million people between Cameron and Hidalgo counties down there. So this is the area that's got, you know, Brownsville, Harlingen, McAllen, Edinburgh, Mission. So a lot of people are moving down there. Weather's great if you like that kind of South Florida humid weather. The Mexican city right across the border from Brownsville is Matamoros, and a running theme with the border area in Texas is that it's really hard to tell sometimes which side is the U.S. and which side is Mexico, because if you see a photo from far away, it's hard to tell exactly where the border is, and the whole thing looks like one giant city, but Matamoros and Brownsville is essentially one city that's separated by the river. Continuing west, the next main city on the border is Laredo, which is right across the Rio Grande from Nuevo Laredo. And just like Brownsville and Matamoros, sometimes it's hard to tell from an aerial photograph what side is which if you can't actually see the river in the photo. And with Laredo being pretty poor on American standards and Nuevo Laredo being pretty wealthy on Mexican standards, there really isn't much difference in that regard either, although you're less likely to be shot on the American side. But uh, Laredo is probably the most Mexican city in the U.S. You know, all the other cities along the border are American cities with a large Mexican population, but Laredo feels more like a Mexican city with the you know, the plaza and the storefronts and the layout of the downtown. So if you want to see what Mexico might be like, but you don't want to cross the border or you don't have a passport, then, you know, go check out Laredo. That's kind of what you might expect. Nuevo Laredo is much larger. So it's the much larger half. Now, this is the busiest border crossing as well. So a lot of stuff that's imported from Mexico, like cars or whatever, is coming across the border at Laredo. The next town along the border is Eagle Pass. That sits across the river from Piedras Negras. And these are both much smaller than Laredo and Nuevo Laredo, so there's not anywhere near as much traffic at this border. These are both fairly small towns. And, you know, Eagle Pass is a pretty cute little downtown, nice courthouse and some historic buildings and stuff there. And, you know, again, it's just another town where it's just one city where the river cuts through it. And Piedras Negras is a pretty neat little Mexican town. It's, you know, nothing like the crazy crime-ridden, you know, other big cities along the border. So... Uh, this is a pretty neat little spot, so if you want to go across the border and not have to worry about being kidnapped and beheaded, then this is a pretty good spot to do it. 
Continuing west, the next town along the border is Del Rio, which sits right across the river from Acuna. And these are each a little bit bigger than Eagle Pass and Piedras Negras, but nowhere near as large as Laredo or Nuevo Laredo. And just as how Laredo is the most Mexican city along the border, Del Rio is arguably the most American city along the border. It's hard to even tell you're right there next to Mexico. It feels like just any other Texas town, but it's also kind of bland. But Acuna isn't that big, but even though it's not that big, it has had some issues with crime and gangs and stuff. So don't be thinking because it's a smaller town, it's going to be a lot safer than some of the bigger ones. I mean, you'll probably be safe if you go there, but it still isn't that terribly safe. But once you get past Del Rio, the scenery changes quite a bit. You don't really expect spectacular scenery when you think of Texas, but once you get north and west of Del Rio, the scenery in southwest Texas is truly spectacular. Just outside of town is the Amistad Dam and Reservoir. And this is just a you know a reservoir right there on the border. So half the lake is in the U.S. and half is in Mexico. And just past that is Seminole Canyon State Park, which is a really pretty spot. I've camped there a couple of times. Some nice hiking trails there. And the canyon itself is very pretty. So the Rio Grande Car is a really nice spot right through this area. So this is a really pretty spot to check out if you want to do some camping or hiking right there along the border. When you continue west is where the scenery gets truly wonderful. You get to Big Bend National Park. This is a beautiful spot. I've been there a couple times. I love camping there and hiking. There's some really good trails there. You know, you get the nice view of the river. You know, it's a really deep canyon right there. And you can go across the river into Mexico to a small town called Boquilla del Carmen. And there's no road that leads into that town. So that town is only accessible from the U.S. So it's a kind of a, a unique spot in Mexico. So it's worth checking out if you're down in the national park. But again, this is some really gorgeous scenery in southwest Texas. And this part of Texas is very lightly populated. There's only a couple of small towns there. Presidio is right there on the border, but that's a really small town. And there really aren't any roads that follow the border between here and just east of El Paso. So it's just kind of empty country, just mountainous, and this beautiful scenery that's left alone by people. Continuing west, you head into the city of El Paso, which is the largest city that sits right along the border. It's about 800,000 people in El Paso and over a million people in the metro area. So it's a pretty big city. And, you know, I, I like El Paso. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's got some nice historic downtown. It's right across the river from Juarez, which was really famous in the early 2000s for being the most dangerous city in the world. And it's kind of ironic because El Paso is one of the safest cities in the U.S. That's kind of one of the interesting things about some of these border towns is they're actually some of the safer cities in the country. I'm not really sure why. I think it might be because, you know, say you're a drug cartel guy and you're, you know, the crime is to get the stuff into the U.S. But once the stuff is in the U.S., those drugs and things aren't going to El Paso or Brownsville. They're going to New York and L.A. and Chicago. So, you know, once they're across the border, there's go, 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 go. Let's get into the U.S. So that's why I think there aren't too many, why the cities along the border are nowhere near as dangerous as you might think. Even though the cities in Mexico right across the border are some of the most dangerous ones in Mexico. Once you get past El Paso, you get into New Mexico, and of the four states that sit along the border, New Mexico has by far the shortest amount of land that sits along the border. Uh, there are very few people that live in the border part of New Mexico. The only little town there is called Columbus, and it's got a little tiny little checkpoint there. It's so cute. Uh, you get the Oregon Mountains there, which is a beautiful national monument and some nice hiking. and just another spot where there are very few people that live there, and the boot heel of New Mexico is one of my favorite parts of the entire country. It's really gorgeous. When people that live nowhere near the border think about what it might look like, they're probably thinking about what it looks like along the Arizona stretch of the border, which is a lot more open desert, flat, and there are less physical barriers there. So in the Texas area, you have the Rio Grande and some of the mountains and canyons. In New Mexico, you have a lot of mountains as well. In the California stretch, you have a lot of sand dunes and mountains. But the Arizona part is just mostly open, flat desert. So, you know, this is what a lot of people think about. This has got the Roadrunner cartoon kind of thing. So, you know, it's very pretty scenery, but this is just kind of the, you know, a little more open, flat, uh, going in from the U.S. to Mexico. When you get into Arizona, the first town along the border is Douglas, which hits across the border from Agua Prieta. And this is, you know, it doesn't have the physical barrier of the Rio Grande or mountains or canyons or sand dunes or anything. It's just kind of straight and flat. So you just have a fence there. It's kind of interesting, you know, and it, but it is just like the Texas towns where there really isn't any differentiation between the towns. It's just one city separated by a fence. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like if in the city you have a nice part of town and the ghetto part of town and you know, Douglas is the nicer part of town and Aqua Prieta is the ghetto, but it really is just kind of one town. Um, so it's not quite as spectacular scenery as you have in the Texas area because you don't have, again, those physical barriers that are really, really cool to look at. But anyway, uh, when you continue west from there, you get to Nogales, which hits along the interstate. That's across the border from Nogales, Mexico. And this is another spot where it's just, you know, a fence separating the two and it's just another one big town. Of course, it's a lot different when it's just got one name for the entire town because it really is just one town. So... The Arizona parts are not quite as pretty as the Texas or New Mexico or California stretches, but, um, you know, it is still pretty interesting. 
West of Nogales, you'll enter the Tohono Indian Reservation. And I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it, but it is a large reservation right on the border. And there are no towns in the reservation that are right on the border. It's just kind of you know, little towns that are uh, inside the border. But it's very interesting in this part of the, the border area because, you know, it's a, it's a reservation. So the tribe is on both sides of the border. So you have these two European colonized countries. You know, you got the U.S. and Mexico. We'll draw the lines here. and We're going to cut it right through this indigenous group. But I don't know. I think that's kind of silly when you think of it in that regard. But that's what you have west of Nogales. West of the Indian Reservation is Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument. This is just a big, vast, open desert, lowland desert you know, giant cacti. So it's pretty cool to see if you haven't seen those big cacti. And there's a little town there called Lukeville. That's across the border from a little town called Sonoita. This is a pretty popular crossing for people that want to go to Puerto Penasco. It's about an hour drive into Mexico from there. And it's to the northern point of the Sea of Cortez. So it's pretty popular with uh, spring breakers or partiers or people that just want to go down to Mexico, get there really easily, but also be on the beach. You know, little beach resort kind of town. So it's perfectly safe. That's one of the more safe spots in Mexico to go to. So, but yeah, if you like the desert, you like that kind of open giant cacti kind of thing, that's what you're going to get out here in the southwestern part of Arizona. The land is so barren and desolate out here, they have an Air Force bombing range. And it's huge. It takes up a huge chunk of southwestern Arizona. So I guess we're just doing bombing runs there. Yeah, we'll just bomb the desert. If we're going to try something, might as well be here. Um, but I haven't actually obviously been there. I don't really recommend driving through the Air Force bombing range. They'll probably shoot you before you get to the range anyway. But that's what you get between Oregon Pipe Cactus and Yuma. Continuing west is the town of San Luis, Arizona. And that sits across the river from San Luis, Rio, Colorado and Mexico. And just like the areas in Texas, you know, it's just one town that's separated by a river. But of course, there's no water in the river here. It's just like a dry riverbed or a trickle. Um, these are pretty small towns. So, you know, San Luis... Mexico is not at all one of those kind of ghetto kind of towns. And San Luis, Arizona is a nice little town too as well. So uh, just north of that is Yuma. And that sits at the, the tri-point of Arizona, California, and Mexico. So once you get past Yuma, you're in California. But Yuma is, I mean, super hot. I mean, probably the hottest I've ever been in in the summertime is in Yuma. So if you want to die of heat stroke, go to Yuma. Have a good time. When you enter California, you'll be right near the Imperial Sand Dunes. And these are really impressive, just huge sand dunes. It's like what you would expect to find in the Middle East, like in the empty quarter of Saudi Arabia, or like in the middle of the Sahara kind of thing. So they're really cool. You can get out and run around in them. You can you know, roll down the hills, and they have stuff for like dune buggies and stuff like that as well. So pretty cool thing to see these uh, sand dunes. And then the next town along the border is Calexico, which is right across the border from Mexicali. Calexico is a pretty small town. Mexicali is a pretty big city. It's the capital of Baja, California. It's a lot more of a business kind of city. It's not the, you know, the drink, 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 tequila shots all day long kind of town. It's got a lot of people in suits doing the government kind of stuff for Baja, California, which is a pretty well populated state in Mexico. Continuing west from Calexico and Mexicali, it's hard to get into the higher elevations as you go over the Vallecito Mountains, which are really nice. And Vallecito Mountains are what separates the wonderful, you know, coastal California climate from the horrible desert California climate just east of it. So these are pretty important mountains in terms of that because east of that, you had the rain shadow, which is very dry, sandy, open desert. And west of that is that, you know, again, that gorgeous California climate as you get closer to the coast. In the same area is another native group called the Kumaye. And I apologize, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but this is another group where the tribe is on both sides of the border. So I just find it very interesting when there's, you know, an arbitrary line that's drawn by Americans or Spaniards to, you know, to separate this group, but they don't care what country they're in. It's the same tribe on both sides, but this is a group that you are going to find on the, the windward side of the Vallecito Mountains. The next town along the border is Tecate in Mexico. There really isn't an American town on the side of the border where Tecate is. And this is a great little town. This is probably the nicest town right along the border in Mexico. So it's got a lot of wineries and spas, just more laid back. It's not the place to you know, go bar hopping all night. So if a little bit older, you want a little more laid back Mexico experience, Tecate is a great place. And of course, it's mostly well known for that really crappy beer they make there. But, you know, it's a pretty cool city. So if you're visiting San Diego or if you're from San Diego, I mean, go to Tecate. It's a pretty cool place to check out. It's not very well known in terms of like, you know, spring breakers and those kind of people. So it's just, again, much more laid back and a pretty cool place to check out. And then along the coast, you have the huge metro area of San Diego County into Tijuana. So this is just a, you know, 5 million people metro area when you count both sides. Over 3 million in San Diego County and a couple of million in Tijuana. So, you know, a lot of people here, very busy border crossing. In fact, the border crossing at San Ysidro is so busy, they had to build another one at Ote Mesa about 
15, 20 years ago. So and that one's super busy now. So they probably have to build another one. But this is where, of course, you have a ton of people. And, you know, San Diego and Tijuana have the world's greatest climate. So, if, you know, this is, you want to know what the best weather on earth is? Well, this is where it is. And, of course, the border has no effects whatsoever on the climate. So it's wonderful on both sides of it. Tijuana itself is very notorious for being this a place of debauchery right across the border. You have all these, you know, red light places and just all the bars along Avenue de la Revolucion. And that's where a lot of the young people go because you only have to be 18 to drink there. But there actually is a pretty cool arts and cultural scene in Tijuana. Once you get a little more into the city, there's a really wealthy part of town where you have some, you know, really nice old houses. And so it isn't the, the whole, you know, cluster that everybody thinks it might be. It's, it is kind of still pretty ghetto, but there are some really nice parts of Tijuana as well. The western terminus of the U.S.-Mexico border is Borderfield State Park in California. And this is right along the coast. And it's pretty interesting because you have like a little fence that goes right there and it goes out into the ocean. So it's just kind of interesting, you know, from the aerial photographs, you can kind of see the stadium on the Tijuana side and the parking lot to the state park is on the California side. But just this kind of shows where you have to be. So it really shows you just how not that big of a deal the border itself is from a geographical standpoint, but from a political standpoint, of course, you have that wall that goes right down the beach. I'm not going to really get into talking about a border wall from a political perspective, but from a purely geographical perspective, it's not really necessary or feasible through a large part of the border. So in the urban areas, such as El Paso or Brownsville or Laredo, you wouldn't need to have a wall because you have such a huge human presence there. And also having a wall just would just be ridiculous. So imagine if you're you know, familiar with, say, Detroit or Niagara Falls right along the border with Canada. Well, you'd have a, a three to four story tall wall going right through downtown Detroit or Niagara Falls, which would be pretty ridiculous. Or think about, say, Brownsville, like I was talking about, where you know downtown goes right up against the border crossing. So the tallest buildings in town are four stories tall, so there would be a wall you know, not far behind those buildings to be right along the border, which would be pretty silly in some of the more urban areas. And outside of the urban areas, you have a lot of natural barriers. So you already have the canyons and the Big Bend area. So you go Seminole Canyon State Park and you got the river. So you have Mother Nature's already got a wall there. So um, through a large part of the border, you just wouldn't need a wall. So if there's going to be a political debate over a border wall, it should only be in areas where the wall is actually feasible for it to be built, which is not in the urban areas or in some of these more remote, desolate, and just, you know, beautiful kind of canyon areas. And I also wanted to talk about something that isn't really mentioned much in talking about the border wall, and that's jaguars and ocelots. And portions of southern Arizona, southern New Mexico, and southwestern Texas are part of the natural jaguar range. And you know, in recent years, there have been a lot of sightings of jaguars and ocelots in this part of the country. So, you know, having a border wall would keep them out, which is a shame because, it's, in my opinion, these are the most beautiful cats in the world. And it's super cool to have them just roaming in this part of the country naturally. So if you want to put a wall up to keep illegal immigrants out, that's fine. But don't keep out the jaguars and the ocelots. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And if you're interested in more stuff about U.S. geography or cross-country road tripping or just some nerdy travel stuff that doesn't have any kind of ridiculous political spin on it, then consider subscribing to this channel because that's the kind of stuff that I'm posting. But yeah, Geography King signing out and about to go down to Puerto Penasco and pass out on the beach.